we're launching a series, a brand new series today, called The Grass is Always Greener. Uh, because all of us, all of us wrestle with that, uh, that thing in life that says, hey, I'm cool with what I have, but once I see something better or see someone better or see a stage of life that seems better, I'm so tempted to look over the fence and see the greener grass. In fact, when I, when I say the phrase, the grass is always greener, how do you fill it in? What are you in that phrase with? Yeah, on the other side. Me too. That's the most common way that I've heard it. I, we, we've got somebody on our team, whoever, whenever this is always talked about, he always says the grass is always greener on top of the septic tank, which is true, <laughs> but that's not what we're going to talk about today. We are going to talk about that thing in us that wants to look over the fence, that thing in us that wants to see the other side as somehow better than what we're currently experience, uh, experiencing. I think the word always is a big deal because when the grass is always greener, that's when it really becomes a problem for all of us. And I know maybe some of you are thinking, well, yeah, I mean, I, I have the grass is always greener syndrome. I think in a way we all have it, but what's the big deal? In this series, we're just going to talk about why is this thing dangerous? What, what's, what's so bad about it and what will it keep us from? But before we really dig into it, I want to just uh, give you some definitions so that we can all get on the same page. So I tried to define what is the green grass? When you say the grass is always greener on the other side, what, what is the green grass? Here, here's the working definition that I came up with that I think maybe will help you and I begin to identify what that thing is in all, in all of us. The green grass refers to that thing that I think, I don't currently have, that I think will give me what I actually want most. The, the green grass refers to that object, that car, that job, that person, that season of life that I think will give me what is the thing that I think I really want most. Now, the reason why I say that I think and highlight that word, those words specifically, is because it is, it's one of those things that happens inside of our brain. The, the green grass concept, it's really a mind game that we all play, right? It, it's something that I, I don't know for sure. It just seems like they're happy, and if they're happy, then maybe they have something that I don't have because that's really what I want. And, and the lens that we see the green grass through, they're goggles that have the words what and if on it, right? What if I drove that car? What if I had that job? What if I had that person? Or what if I was friends with that group of people? Or what if I lived there? Or what if I could travel there and vacation there? The great news about social media is that social media has cured all of this for us, right? It doesn't exacerbate it a bit. No, it actually clearly makes it way worse because we used to have to dream about what other people have, what other people have. Now we just see it on a constant basis. So, so to try to help us, I thought it would be a good exercise for us to just fill in the blank on this statement. As soon as I get blank, I'll have what I want. As soon as I get fill in the blank, then I'll have what I want. What, what is that thing for you? What is that thing that you would put in the blank there? Maybe for some of you, you would say, as soon as I get out of debt, I'll have what I want, <laughs> which is why so many of you have chosen the lottery as your way to get out of debt, right? Maybe you're thinking that, that that's the way it's going to happen for me, and as soon as I get it, then I will have what I want. Some of you would say, as soon as I get my own home, then I'll have what I want, right? I love this guy sitting on this couch just chilling, straight chilling with his parents, right? If you're living at home right now, we just want to say, I get, that's tough. That's a tricky situation to have. And some of you are doing it because you can save money, which is an awesome thing. And maybe you're thinking, maybe you believe, you see your friends that have their own place and you think, oh, as soon as I get my own home or my own place, then I'm going to have exactly what I want. And your parents are going, that's right. That is exactly true. <laughs> now, maybe some of you would say, as soon as I get a new job, then I'll have what I want. Or, or maybe it's as soon as my spouse gets a new job. Maybe you're waiting on your wife to get a new job or your husband to get a new job or maybe a, a, a different job where he doesn't have to work so much or she doesn't have to work so much or, 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 or they get paid more. And you're thinking, then and only then will I have what I really want. For those of you that are uh, teachers or school administrators, you're probably thinking, as soon as I get to summertime, then I'll have what I want. 
Everyone who's a parent is thinking, nope, it's quite the opposite. As soon as next fall rolls back around, then I will have all that I ever want. It's amazing how that works, right? Maybe some of you are thinking, as soon as I get married, as soon as I get married, then I'll have what I want. The amazing thing is, some of you are married and you're thinking, if only I wasn't, then I would have what I want. That's the sad part of it, right? Some of you are, maybe your thing is as soon as we get to have kids, then we'll have what we want, right? (laughs) For those of you that have kids, you know that's just not true. That's the sinister laugh of parents going, oh, no, 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 no. I have a friend, this is a true story. I have a friend who his wife really wanted to have kids and he was like, I'm not ready yet. And so she said, okay, I got an idea. How about we get a dog? And he's like, okay, that seems like a good, you know, like let's try this thing. So they got a dog, had the little puppy for three days. And this puppy was so bad, so loud at night, poop and peeing in their house that they decided we're giving the dog back and we're gonna decide, try to have kids. Which, that is not a reason why you should have children, right? The other amazing thing is, if you notice how people, when they talk about the fond parts of their life, they talk about before they had kids, and then they talk about after they have kids, like when their kids have all moved out, you know? Which just makes my life all the more difficult. We've got five kids, uh, ages nine, seven, five, three, and then a little baby. So uh, we're right in the middle of it. And so I'm staring at those of you who are empty nesters going, oh, that must be the life. And those of you who are empty nesters, you're probably thinking, it is. It is the life. I, yeah, I don't know. Surely, it looks awesome to do whatever you want to do whenever you want to do it. It's just amazing. No, all, all of this, see, what, what all of this speaks to, I mean, if we were to really try to pull the curtain back on this, try to get underneath, you know, this is really a, a big deal in life, to try, to try to figure out what is underneath the thing that I really want. You know how important this is, right? Because sometimes you think you want this, but what you really want is that. You think that this is the thing that you're really after, but it's really the thing that's underneath it that you got to pay attention to. See, I think what's underneath the greener grass mindset is this insatiable appetite for more. This thing in all of us that says no matter how good my yard gets, it's never going to be good enough. Or no matter how much money I have, it's never going to be enough. Or no matter how good the job is, or how much freedom it gives me, or flexibility it gives me, it's just, it's not going to be enough. It it leaves us with this insatiable appetite for more. And if we were to put a word on, well, what is that? I mean, it shows up in a lot of different ways. I mean, sometimes it's just straight up greed, which that's hard to, it's hard to explain, and it's definitely hard to see in the mirror. Maybe it's envy, I want what that person has, or jealousy, I'm worried because I think they're going to come take what I have, or lust, I want it so bad that I want to touch it, I want to hold it, I want it to be mine. Or idolatry, putting anything on the throne, or putting anything, making it king, or making it the thing of our life. Materialism, just that desire that this stuff is going to do it for me, or gluttony, right? It shows up in a lot of different forms, but at the end of the day, always leaves us wanting more of the very thing that we don't have. And it, it's dangerous because it doesn't seem all that wrong. I mean, honestly, all of us have it. It's in all of us. But so what? Genuinely, what is the big deal? And, and that's really why we've decided for three weeks to talk about this, because I don't know when other times in your life you spend 30, 40 minutes thinking about a topic that it's just helpful and it's worth thinking about so that it doesn't do any damage or cause us any trouble. See, I think there are some very real problems with living with a greener grass mindset or a greener grass way. The first one is that it never ever leads to joy. I mean, it never leads to, oh my goodness, now I actually found it. You know this to be true. You know people around you that are chasing something or worse, they got it and then it didn't make them happy. It never leads to actual fulfillment, satisfaction, deep contentment, joy in life. I think the other problem is that it it makes me the victim. That whenever I see something that you have and I think, ah, 
That's not fair. Why does he get that? Or why does she get that? Or that looks so great. Or even if I'm going, bless your heart, which is the Christian way of saying good for you, you know, must be nice. Even if I feel that way, there's something about it that makes me a victim. It, it allows me to think, oh, well, woe is me. I, I, I don't like my life anymore. I'm getting a raw deal because of how good you have it. And it's actually a way to allow us to be irresponsible, to not take responsibility for our own life because it, it makes us feel like a, a martyr or a victim. Maybe the worst part about it is that it literally robs us of life. It takes life from us. It's like a thief. The greener grass mindset, I, I really believe it is lurking in your life. It is lurking in my life. And if we allow it to, it wants to sneak its way into our lives and take life from us if we allow it to. Maybe the most difficult part of the greener grass way is the low hum of discontentment that it creates. Have you ever noticed this? In fact, if the green grass that's on the other side, if it had a shadow, the shadow would be discontentment. See, I, I really believe discontentment follows the greener grass around like a shadow. You, you know how shadows work. Everywhere you go, your shadow's with you. It's always following you. And I think in the shadow of the greener grass comes just this low hum of discontentment. I just am not really satisfied with my stuff. I've got little kids that they do this all the time, right? They are, just the other day, our three-year-old Cooper saw something our five-year-old Sally had, and it looked like it was making her happy. So now how does he feel? He wants what she has. And so he goes over there and he grabs it, you know, and I'm yelling like, hey, we don't grab stuff from our, si our siblings. And he looks at me like, well, if you knew how awesome this was, you would understand why I grabbed it. And then 30 seconds later, what's he, what, he, what is he doing? Not playing with the thing he just grabbed. He's already laid it down and he's on to something else. He just saw it for that brief moment. And he thought, ooh, I would like that because it seems like it's making her happy or him happy. That's the way we all do as kids, and we really don't grow out of it, but the problem is, is that it creates discontentment in us. So what I want to do over the next few minutes is I just want to tell you a story to illustrate this. This is a story from the history of the nation of Israel, and it's really the story that runs in the background of maybe one of the most famous stories in all of the Bible. You've heard the story about David and Goliath. Well, this is kind of the story that was running in the background that was really the, the more disappointing, the sadder part of the story. See, God had already led his people. You know how maybe the history of the nation of Israel worked? God, God had led his people out of slavery. They were in Egypt, enslaved. Moses led them out, and he took them into the desert. Now, they hated the desert. They hated the desert so bad that they had moments where they said, we'll go back to slavery. This is awful. So they looked out at the desert thinking if only we could be free, they got free, and then they wished they were back in slavery. Now, a couple generations later, they finally get to walk into the promised land. Moses didn't get to take them there, but Joshua got to lead them into the promised land. This is a huge moment for God's people. It's the land that was flowing with milk and honey. They loved it. It was basically Jenny's ice cream on every corner, or whatever ice cream you like. I don't know what your flavor is, but it was like that all the time. They loved it. It was awesome. But then it wasn't enough. They started looking across the borders at other countries, other nations, and the other countries, the other nations, they all had a ruler. They had a king. But you see, God's nation, the nation of Israel, it didn't have a king. No, God said, I, I would like to be your king. But the people said, well, we don't want you to be our king. We want our own king which is amazing because you would have thought that that would have deeply offended God, and maybe it did, but he was such a kind, gracious God that he was like, okay, I'll relent, and so he let them have a king. That's where we pick up the story. In 1 Samuel 9, they're on this exploration to go find their king. Beginning of chapter 9, it says this, that there was a Benjamite, a man of standing, whose name was Kish, son of Abiel, the son of Zerah, the son of Becherath, the son of... Aphiai, Aphia of Benjamin. See, I don't know how to say these names, okay? I remember when I was a kid, I used to hear preaching. I'm like, how do you know how to say that? It turns out they didn't know either. They just were confident with it, you know? And so that's all I'm trying to be, even though I ran over a couple of those like it was a 
you know, flat tire or something. But nonetheless, they went to the, the tribe of Benjamin and they find this guy named Kish. And Kish had a son and his son's name was Saul. And Saul was as handsome as any young man. He was as handsome a young man as could be found anywhere in Israel, and he was a head taller than anyone else. Now, we've got to pause here because there's something for us to, be, to, to learn about. See, whenever someone tries to define you, this is so important because part of the greener grass problem is that there's something about ourselves that we don't like. We don't have a firm answer for the question of who are you? And if you don't know who you are, other people are going to try to define who you are. And if you allow them to, their definitions will stick. And just based on Saul's life, what we see here is that these two definitions of him stuck. Number one, it's always dangerous to let people define you or to begin to define yourself as something external. And so for him to be described as someone who is more handsome than anyone else, good for him, but be careful, Saul, on defining yourself that way. But then secondly, he was defined as someone who was not just tall, but taller than everyone else. See, I think there's something in that for all of us because we're constantly wanting to know, I don't want to know how I'm doing. I want to know how am I doing versus everyone else. And we're constantly doing this. Just this week, I got a text message from my wife. I'm at work just bouncing around. I get this text message from her. The same block of text said, one of our kids aced a test at school. The other one wet their pants at the playground. All in the same text. And I immediately was going, one of our kids aced their test. Oh, I must be a great parent. One of our kids wet their pants. What's my problem? Immediately, like in the same text message. Because it's in all of us to try to define ourselves based on not how am I doing, how am I doing versus everyone else around me. And Saul, unfortunately, seemed to, based on the way the rest of his life worked out, he seemed to allow that to get inside of him. And it doesn't create a healthy thing when we begin to define ourselves based on anything external or based on how other people are doing. You got to run your race. You got to play your game. If I could talk to Saul, I would love to be able to tell him, hey, Saul, you be you, man. God created you the way he created you and you go be you. But it got inside of Saul. And it, it messed him up. We, we see just a couple chapters later this story of the way David and Goliath went down, right? Saul is there listening to this giant across the way talk smack, you know, like WWE, like the Bushwhackers kind of smack. You remember the Bushwhackers? Best wrestlers of all time. Don't at me. Um, across the way, Goliath's talking smack, and Saul is going like, I don't know what we're going to do. This little kid rolls up. He's bringing literally some cheese and some cold cuts to his brothers because they had so much wine. W-H-I-N-E. Get it? Church joke. Nonetheless, Saul says, I don't know what we're going to do. He lets David run out there, and David kills the giant. Now, of course, this is cool that David did this, but good for Saul. He's the one in charge. He's the king still. He's got everything under his care but he didn't like the way people were praising David. In 1 Samuel 18, 6, here's what happened when this group of people came back home. When the men were returning home after David had killed the Philistine, the women came out from all the towns of Israel to meet King Saul. This is awesome. Saul, look, all the women are rushing out to meet you, way to go. And they're singing and dancing with joyful songs and timbrels and lyres. It's not a party until they break out the timbrels and the lyres. You know what I mean? Like that's when it's really getting lit, so to speak. But as they danced, they sang this song. Saul has slain his thousands, David his tens of thousands, and on and on they went. 
Saul, he's awesome. He's slain his thousands. And David, his tens of thousands. What did these women mean by this song? We don't know. Maybe nothing. It's in another language. They didn't say, Saul's killed thousands, but David has killed. They didn't say that. They said, Saul, he's awesome. He's killed thousands. David, and he's killed tens of thousands. It's a lyric to a song. If you base your life on what Taylor Swift has written about in a lyric to a song, good luck trying to figure life out. You know what I'm saying? But Saul, I mean, it, this, this messed him up because somehow in his mind, he's going, wait a second, David, thousands, me, tens of thousands. Are they saying that David is not just better than me, but 10 times better than me? Oh no, what does this now say about me? I almost tripped over the stool. That would have said a lot about me <laughs> if I would have done that. This is how he responded. Saul was very angry. This refrain displeased him greatly. I don't know if he had ever said this out loud, but the author somehow just knew. I bet in his mind he thought they have credited David with tens of thousands, but me only with thousands. And then this next line is really important. He said, or he thought, what more can he get? But the kingdom, what kind of dumb question is that? He doesn't have anything. He has some women who've included his name in a song. What do you have? Everything. You're the king, the first king. You have it all. But he's going, no, what I have is not enough. And it was like he got a stool out and got up next to the fence, stepped on his stool, and for the rest of his life was just looking over the fence, going, what's David's life like? What does he have? What do people think about him? What's he doing that I'm not doing? See, this next little line that the author of 1 Samuel included is this, and from that time on, Saul kept a close eye on David. See, what Saul should have kept a close eye on was what that thing was inside of him that was bothered by the song. I mean, imagine if he would have kept a close eye on that. Saul doesn't have the best reputation in the history of Christianity or the church or the Old Testament. But imagine if, what if Saul had decided, you know what, I wonder why, why does that bother me so much? I'm going to think through that. I'm going to go sit down with a counselor and ask this counselor, this is really messing with me. I got it all, but the one song is ripping me apart. It's tearing me up, and I can't figure it out. David's inside my head, and he's eating my lunch. He's got my sandwich. He's got my Cheetos. He's got my Oreos. He's got all the Ziploc bags inside of themselves ready to be thrown away. He's eating or recycled. He's eating them all. Why is that? He didn't pay attention to it. I wish you would have. I wish you would have chosen to celebrate David. What if he'd have been like, man, David, way to go. That's so cool, man. What, thank you. Like, you've made my job a whole lot easier because that Philistine was literally killing us. But you took care of him. Thank you. I'm going to give you a sweet palace, give you a nice ride, and then you're going to not have to pay taxes. I don't know. It's going to be awesome for you. But he didn't do that. No, he didn't celebrate. Instead, what he should have been celebrating turned into hating. And that's the same thing for you and me. You gotta pay attention. What's the thing that you don't wanna celebrate? Because that's usually the birth of the hate. The thing that you have a hard time cheering for is usually where the hatred begins. And that negative emotion will tear you apart. And it will rob you of life. Maybe the saddest part of this whole story is you, you would have thought that David would have learned, right? I mean, the way the rest of the story unfolds is for the rest of Saul's life, it's just a battle. He's trying to outsmart, outwit, outflank, outdo David for his whole life. 
I mean, there's this moment where David is in the presence of Saul and he's rocking the harp, all right? So just imagine. I don't know the last time you've seen somebody shred a harp was, but David could really play the harp. And when Saul was, when he was king for a while, he had these terrors that eventually, I'm sure, were caused by David. He probably had nightmares about him at this point in his life. And so he invited David in to come because whenever David played the harp, you know, just, I don't know, whatever the harp sounds like, it just, it soothed Saul's mind. It calmed him down. But there's this moment where Saul is probably going, oh, my goodness, this is ridiculous. Like, seriously? I mean, you're this military, amazing guy who killed the, the giant, and now you're shredding a harp? Like, what can't you do? And he picked up his spear and threw it at David, which was the point in David's life where he began to run. And who would have blamed him? Someone throws a spear at you, run. Simple way of life, you know what I'm saying? move on in his life. Saul eventually dies in this chase trying to outdo David. And then David becomes king. Now what doesn't David have? Pretty much everything. He, he's got it all. Everything you could ever want, everything you could ever need, he's got it all. And he's got the cautionary tale of the king who came before him. But it, it didn't keep him from failing his greener grass test. See, in 2 Samuel 11, the next, the next uh, chronicle of the history of God's people, this nation, says this in chapter 11, verse 1. In the springtime, this is toward the end of David's life, in the spring, at the time when kings go off to war, David sent Joab out with the king's men and the whole Israelite army. Now, where should have David been? He probably should have been out at war with the people that he was leading. But he had trained them up so well, and they did so well, that they destroyed the Ammonites and they besieged Rabbah. But David remained in Jerusalem. And one evening, David got up from his bed, walked around on the roof of his palace, probably to see what he owned, see what he reigned over. And from the roof, he saw a woman bathing. And he thought, oh wow, this seems awesome. Because not only did he see this woman bathing, but the woman was very beautiful. And so David sent someone out to find out about her. And the report came back in. The man who brought the information back said, sir, king, she is Bathsheba. She is the daughter of Eliam or Eliam depending on which way you want to pronounce it. And she's the wife of Uriah the Hittite. Now, how could David respond here? He could have said, man, good for Uriah. That's so cool. That lucky dog. I'm so happy for him. I can't believe he got married and he didn't even invite me to the wedding. That's crazy. Not mad, though. Saw it on Facebook. I've already dealt with those emotions. I'm excited for him. I'm genuinely excited. Way to go. And he would have been known as this amazing king. But that's not what he did. For those of you that know the rest of the story, this ended up really affecting his life. Cost him the life of one of his sons. It tainted his legacy. I would imagine it tormented his family. All because he, he looked over the fence and saw something that he wanted and it created this shadow of discontentment in his own life. I'm telling you, if it can happen to Saul, it can happen to you. And it, if it can happen to Saul, and it can happen to David, it can happen to you, and it can happen to me. And I really believe that this is a, this is a lesson that all of us are going to learn at some point in life. That here are some ways. Let me give you three options on how you could learn this lesson. Because I just think, David, 
you already saw all this play out. See, here's one way you could learn it. You could never get it, but you could die chasing it. You know what I'm saying? Like you could never get whatever that thing is that you're chasing, but you could die trying to chase it. Have you ever read a biography? Have you ever seen a movie? Have you ever heard a story of a person who wanted so bad to get wherever there is enough money, enough stuff, enough equity, enough relational uh, uh, stature, whatever it is, and they never got it, and they died chasing it. You'll learn the lesson that way. Or, this one's maybe more sad, but you could get it and then realize that it doesn't satisfy you. How disheartening is that? Some of you, you wanted so bad to be married, or you wanted that job, or you wanted that house, and the same negative emotion that drove you to get it is the same emotion that's present when you got it that keeps you from enjoying it. Or you realize maybe it was never meant to give me what I thought it was going to give me. There's this uh, amazing philosopher who starred in a movie called Ace Ventura. His name's Jim Carrey. Um, <laughs> no, I, I'm going to show you this quote by Jim Carrey, and I thought, why in the world does Jim Carrey have this quote? It's like the deepest, most profound quote and I just picture him as Ace Ventura saying this, and it kind of ruins it, but don't do that. Just read the quote for what it is. But supposedly Jim Carrey said this. So just read this. This is amazing. I think everybody should get rich and famous and do everything they ever dreamed of so they can see that it's not the answer. Isn't that amazing? See, we know this to be true. But the question is, will we learn from it I want to give you a third way that I think you can learn this. You can chase it your whole life and die never getting it. You can get it and realize that it didn't meet your needs. Or there's another way that you can learn this. And I, at this point, this is the part of the message where I feel like I'm going to tell you this and you're going to check out and go, oh, I assumed you'd say that. Or you're going to go, yeah, right. But I'm just telling you, don't ask me. Ask somebody who you feel like is age 60, 70, 80 and above and has lived a, a life of satisfaction and ask them what they think. You can learn to trust your heavenly father. You can learn to believe that where you are is where he has you. That following him really is the answer to finding what you're looking for. Because you see, I don't believe that the greener grass is a myth in that it doesn't exist. I actually believe in this life Every single one of us has an upgrade of satisfaction that's available. I believe it for you. I believe there is an upgrade of contentment or joy or deep, meaningful richness in life that you actually can experience in this life. And I don't think that boat is going to help you find it. I don't think the job is going to help you find it. I don't believe the marriage is going to help you find it. I really believe that... The way you find the greener grass is by letting your Father in heaven lead you there. Why, why do I believe that? Well, for one, I've experienced it in my own life, but for another reason, because there is this, there is this book called Psalms. They're, they're actually songs. They're song lyrics. It's like poetry, but they're, they're amazing. And, and maybe the one of the most popular ones, one of the most famous ones, one that I think is maybe the most beautiful one, it reads like this. Just listen to this. Psalm 23, verse 1, the Lord is my shepherd. And because of that, I lack nothing. In poverty and in wealth, I lack nothing. In sickness and in health, I lack nothing. And part of what he does is he makes me lie down in the green pastures, the greenest of pastures. He invites me into the pasture and he lets me lay down in it. And he leads me beside these quiet, still waters and he refreshes my soul. Not the grass or the water, but he refreshes my soul. 
And he guides me along the, the right path, the best path for me, not to make me great, but for his namesake, for his own glory, or, or, or because he's great, not to make me look great. And even though I walk through the darkest valley, the hard times, the difficult times, I don't have to fear evil because he's always with me. And his rod and his staff, they comfort me. I believe that's possible for you. You know who wrote that? King David. So why did he miss it? I don't know, but you don't have to miss it. You can learn it. You can get it. You can trust your heavenly father and believe that that's the greener grass that he wants to lead you into. I just know for me, I don't want to waste any more of my life wanting someone else's life. And so I'd say the same thing to you. Don't waste your own life wishing for a different one. Would you trust your Father in heaven? Would you let him lead you so that you can learn to enjoy your own? So that you can learn to celebrate others? so that you can learn to enjoy the greener grass that he has for you? David somehow forgot it. He saw it in Saul, but then he forgot it. You don't have to forget it. He's got greener grasses for you. He wants to lead you into them, but you gotta trust him and you gotta follow him.